Welcome back. In this demonstration, I'm going to paint these two ducks, which are buffle heads, in gouache. And I'm using gouache because uh, it has a nice opacity that uh, I think will work really nicely for the, both the water and the ducks. And uh, you could do this in transparent watercolor or acrylic as well, but this demonstration is just going to show you how to build up the different layers uh, in gouache. So I just want to tell you a little bit about gouache. Um, it generally comes in tubes, although there is one brand that comes in a little pan set, or cakes is what they call them, because they're not really uh, the traditional pans, although you can pop these out, and I don't know if you can purchase replacements or not, but this has a really nice wide range of different colors. I have them, whoops, I have them painted in little swatches here, so you can kind of see what they look like. I tend to prefer working with a uh, dried paint or a little pan or half pan. So what I do is I actually purchase them separately. You can buy these little metal tins and then you can buy these little plastic uh, containers. Uh, this is a whole pan this size is a half pan and they're really not very expensive and you can reuse them. And then you can also put uh, however many will fit and however many you're interested in having in um, in this little uh, pan set. So you can also like mix them together in these little containers. Now I don't know if you can notice this but do you see how these are all a little bit cracked? You know, they're not as nicely um, dried as traditional transparent watercolor. And there is something about uh, gouache that is a little bit more brittle when it dries. So that is a good indication that you should not put this on in what is called an impasto type of application. So don't use real thick paint because it will flake up off because this is slightly brittle. Um, you can get these little sets. Uh, they're not tremendously expensive, and I, I mean they're they're not you know super cheap either. But you end up using them uh, very sparingly because you're not putting the paint on real thickly, and I mean you always thin it with water. This one has what is called a spectrum blue, spectrum red, and spectrum yellow, but uh, this is cobalt, naphthol, and azo. Those are the pigments. And uh, notice that the blue is pretty warm. The red is also pretty warm. This is uh, by M. Graham and Company. This is a Holbein set, and this one has a cooler red that is actually a magenta. The primary yellow is about the same as the other yellow and then a primary cyan as well as a white and black. These are also white and black. Um, this set, the Holbein, uh, has colors that are honestly more accurate if you are going to be mixing colors to produce a variety of different um, different hues. So I have both of these sets in here. This blue is this, and it's a lovely blue whoops, it's a lovely blue, but it is not actually, this is it as well, um, it's not actually accurate in mixing uh, all colors. It has a little tiniest bit of red in it. This spectrum red is also not what would be considered, you know, a, the primary color. This one is also, this is Windsor & Newton, and it's also a little bit redder, but not quite as red, or not quite as orange as this one. So I have these three reds lined up here. You can see this one is almost orange. This one is a little bit cooler, but not completely. This one is the, this one is the magenta, and it is the most accurate if you're going to be using 
your gouache colors to uh, you know mix all of the different ones and what that means is when you mix cyan and magenta you get a beautiful brilliant intense purple if you mix an orangey red with a blue I mean even if you used the cyan um, you'll get a purple but it'll be a little bit kind of toned down it might even be actually kind of a brown looking purple which can be a beautiful color um, but not so much for like say flowers or uh, if you are wanting to get that really intense violet that is uh, just kind of uh, eye popping you use this red that is a little bit in between these two and a blue Let's see where is my blue there and this blue is also a little bit cooler but it isn't a true cyan um, you'll also get a brighter purple than mixing these two but not as bright as if you mix these two because anytime you have a little bit of the complementary color mixed in so that you're mixing all three primary colors the yellow the red and the blue it tones it down just a little bit okay so what I actually do um, these are also all different pigments and each pigment behaves a little bit differently than the others so it isn't just about um, it isn't just about color it's also about the way that the paint behaves in the water this is more critical for transparent watercolor but there is a degree of it in gouache as well so what I do is uh, I like to put them all in this little pan set that I've made myself uh, buying a cheap little uh, metal tin and then these little plastic uh, pans and half pans and then squeezing the tube paint into each of these now like I said gouache is actually a little bit more brittle than transparent watercolor and if you just squirt this in and leave it it will completely flake apart and the chunks will fall out they'll be loose and they'll fall out um, when you tip your um, little metal tin so if you are going to make your own little pan set you'll want to have some a little bit of glycerin and it only takes you know a few drops in each of these pans when the paint is wet and then you mix it in with like a toothpick okay stir it in so that it uh, is fully mixed and then let that dry and you will notice that it won't dry with quite so many cracks and it, I don't really notice that it changes the way that it handles um, I did that after the fact you know I squeezed the tube paint into the little pans they all cracked I had chunks falling out and I thought okay I've got to fix this um, so I rehydrated all of them with water and then I added the glycerin to that after the water had soaked in enough to kind of stir this around but I couldn't get it completely mixed um, because they had already dried all the way so uh, I'm telling you based on my learning experience you know what what to do to avoid that problem okay so if you want to learn how to uh, sketch accurately for your um, nature study here um, I suggest that you look at the videos on uh, drawing or let's see it's called sketching and drawing accurate proportions I think or maybe it's just sketching accurate proportions uh, that will teach you the what we call organizational line approach and it combines gesture and contour and comparing angles and proportions as you are drawing using your pencil so um, say you have a photo reference or say you're drawing from life uh, if you're using photo reference you compare the proportions of say the beak with the width of the head and the beak is about half the width of this head from this point to this point you know and then you can use the same scale 
see how tall the body is, okay, how tall the head is. And then you can use other um, measurements as well. Once you have the head drawn, then you can say, well, um, it's, a, it's almost a head high from that point on the neck down to the base. And that helps you to refine the um, the forms and the shapes. And it's my favorite way of sketching. Um, I mean, whether I'm drawing from a photograph or from life. And there's more details in that video. Um, I'm not going to redo that whole lesson. Um, if you're drawing from life, it's a little bit different. You know, if you're drawing from a photograph, you're placing your pencil um, or measuring tool on the uh, surface of the photograph. But if you're drawing from life, you're holding your arm out uh, at arm's length and uh, squinting with one eye and uh, using your thumb to measure uh, how d far down your pencil and then using that measurement to compare with um, what you're drawing. So if you don't like that approach, there is also the grid drawing approach, which is something that a lot of people find very helpful. Um, I don't personally find it helpful, but everybody's drawing process is different and um, it's perfectly fine if you want to use that. It doesn't, you know, one approach isn't more or less creative or artistic than the other. It's just the way our brain works and, you know, what we find the easiest to do. I also have a video on that uh, in case you want to learn how to do it that way. So anyway, I'm doing a small little demonstration with this um, using a variety of gouache paints. Okay, I'm going to start uh, painting the water first. It's the background and I like to try to paint the background first. Um, it, there isn't necessarily a right or wrong way, uh, but the advantage to painting the background first, if you do choose to do that, is that um, you can layer the those th things that are in the foreground in front of that. So if you go over a little bit, uh, you're not wrecking what uh, you've already painted in the main subject. Rather, if you go over a little bit, you can cover that up when you're painting this. So that's why I uh, tend to paint the background first. First, I'm going to put just kind of an overall film of water on the paper. Primarily just to make it kind of dampened. I'm not trying to get uh, a ton of water on the paper and I'm not going to do the whole background at once. I'm just going to come down to about there for now. Okay, and I've mixed some colors. I guess I should turn this around. I've mixed some colors that are uh, both blues uh, and a blue mixed with brown. And then I'm going to add a little bit of uh, some greens over here. But I'm going to tone it down a bit. Whoops. These are going to be the highlight, highlight areas. You know what, I actually, I guess I'll just do the whole thing in this for now. Except for where the... That'll be kind of the base color. Okay, now I'm going to add these uh, kind of blue shadows. This is very much of kind of a transparent approach to this, and that's going to just be my base layer, if that makes any sense. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit more um, gouache blending and additional layers. I hate it when I get a piece of fuzz in there that creates those weird shapes.
Okay, so this is mostly dry. There are a few little areas that are a little bit uh, puddly, but I'm going to go ahead and start working from the top down. And the reason I'm doing that is so that uh, I don't end up smearing the paint down here when it's wet by working up here. So I'm going to start up here. Kind of the same approach as when you're drawing. Uh, if you're right-handed, starting kind of from this area and working your way down is good. If you're left-handed, starting here and working your way this direction is good. And that is simply because uh, it keeps your hand and your sleeve from dragging in what you just created. Um, particularly when you're adding details and shading and stuff like that. When you're doing the sketching it's not so much of an issue. Alright, so I'm going to add, uh, this is a little bit thicker paint, a little bit more opaque, and I am adding it in little, you know, kind of more controlled areas. I'm using a smaller brush. I still want it to be nice and wet and kind of soupy though. The fun thing about gouache is that it is water soluble uh, even after it is dried. That's why you can put it into a little uh, palette and turn it into those uh, little cakes or half pans. Um, as opposed to acrylic, which once it dries, that's it. You know, you're stuck with whatever you have uh, created. I know I said I was going to use more blues, and I probably will add some blues, but I'm kind of uh, just sticking with the greens for some reason. I don't know what my problem is. Anyway, um, I have squirted out a little bit of white onto the palette. And I'm going to be adding that to some of the colors as well. And I am going to add just a little bit of this dark um, blue. This is like an ultramarine blue mixed with a burnt umber. And it creates, I, I absolutely love mixing ultramarine blue and burnt umber. Um, it just turns into this kind of purpley midnight blue that's very soft. Um, it's just lovely. Okay, now I'm going to kind of blend these areas out just a little bit. We don't want it all to be blendy, but we do want some areas to be a little bit more softened. I'm still working a little bit transparently right now. Um, eventually, I'm going to start uh, layering uh, more opaque colors on top of this. Um, just so you know what I'm doing, uh, actually, I have it zoomed in so you probably can't see. I have some water here, and believe it or not, this is pretty much clear. It's just that it's uh, dark sh shaded there, so you can't. it looks like I have a cup of paint. Um, anyway, uh, I have some fairly clear water. I have a small brush. I rinse my brush off and so it's wet and then I kind of flick it onto the floor. You could also just kind of touch it lightly to a paper towel, uh, like the, the ferrule mainly, and then that will pull a little bit of the water out. So it's a wet brush, but it's not a dripping wet brush. Okay, now see how I went over that a little bit? That's fine because I'm going to be painting on top of that when I paint the actual duck. Okay, so I'm going to continue this process uh, through the whole painting and then I'll show you the next layer.